Um, drying is dangerous in the system um, in that you want it completely done before you're in your combustion stage. You don't want your chunk fuel to be down in the hearth and still be gener having steam coming out of the center and really more dangerously um, pyrolysis or tar gases. You want it fully completed before it goes to the next stage. Okay? Um, the density of the wood will affect, will affect the drying time. As they get denser, they tend to take long, longer to dry. And um, that's most of those. And of course, the amount of uh, moisture you have in it is going to impact your combustion ability. Um, the water that ultimately comes out of this is going to be a drag uh, at your combustion stage, such that the temperature that you can achieve in combustion is dependent on the total amount of water that's vaporizing out and going into the system. Okay? So when you're designing uh, the drying stage as well as the fuel that's going into it, all of these things are in play. Okay? Pyrolysis, similarly, isn't just there is pyrolysis that makes charcoal and tar gas. Um, pyrolysis can great, create a whole different type or range of, of charcoal types and amounts, as well as a whole range of tar types and amounts. Okay? And those are affected by, you control those by the, the heating rate in pyrolysis, the top temperature you achieve, the, how long you leave it in there in residence, the amount of moisture that's in the system while it's in pyrolysis, um, the species or fuel that you're using, uh, which is going to give you different fixed carbon to volatile ratios, um, natural versus densified fuels, again, will have different flow through the material, and even mineral content. There's some very interesting work showing py the pyrolysis species coming out of material being impacted by um, catalytic effects of what, what are the minerals in that particular species. Okay? So, this goes all over the place. Um, the, the cut to the chase simplification that we use is we want to minimize the nastiness of the tars, or we want to maximize their ability to convert down, downstream. So, um, pyrolysis, remember the three stages we usually call primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary tars are literal fragments that come off of the biomass as you heat them. They can exist as a, as a gas. Um, as the temperature goes up, those, those will evolve into other, um, other, other more complicated tar forms. And at the temperatures above 600 C, you start moving into what are called refractory tars, or, which are tars with um, lots of double carbon bonding. The double carbon bonding is really the problem. It takes a lot of energy to make those, and thus a lot of uh, energy to break them back apart. So our main goal in our control of pyrolysis in there is to keep the pyrolysis making stage um, below 600 C. Okay? So with this pyrocoil here, we can drive it over a long distance. Um, we have more residence time, thus we can do it at a lower temperature, get it all done before it, it gets down to where we're actually going to combust and, and burn those tars. Okay? I get that minerals bad. Are there any minerals that might be beneficial, catalytically speaking? Pyrolysis at a lower temperature or more steady state? Um, I'm sure there are. I can't, I can't speak to that off the top of my head. There's a, a couple of very strange papers on this topic that I don't know if they're, they're woo woo or they're such outliers that they, they feel like woo woo. Um, Yeah, 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 yeah. So I can't answer that, but there are interesting things that go on there, okay? And it also really becomes an issue in the slagging stage. Um, slag isn't just the melting points of all of your raw minerals. There's, there's um, interactions between them that um, can actually accelerate. If you get too much of certain ones, it can accelerate the, the silica melting. So um, a specific mineral comp uh, you know, composition uh, if you have, I, I think the ones are potassium and calcium. If you get over certain ratios of that to the silica, it'll increase your slagging amount, which we're dealing with right now on, on some fuels and need to get, get to more clarity on that. Okay? So um, the tar type that you're producing in, in pyrolysis can be significantly impacted by this te the, uh, the temperature at which it's produced. The charcoal um, can also be impacted. Um, depending on the temperature at which you're creating charcoal, you'll have um, varying surface area, you'll have varying amounts of uh, graphination of the charcoal, 
um, such that what happens later, two steps downstream in reduction, your reduction rate will be impacted by how you made the charcoal and pyrolysis. Now fortunately, um, to maximize or to create the charcoal in a way that maximizes the reduction rate, you want to make it at relatively low temperatures and do it slowly. Um, and you actually want it in the end to go up to a very high temperature so it's activated, but you don't want to flash it to that temperature, which is when it starts forming graphite. Okay? So the arrangement of a slow pyrolysis section um, that's, that in the end is going through a hearth area where it's getting up to a, a very high temperature is a reasonable approximation of, of what you'd like to see there. Okay? So those fortunately lined up. Okay? Variability in combustion. Um, typical things we see in a combustion uh, system, your, your temperatures of your air and fuel coming in, your mixture ratios, reaction times, how good you're mixing. Uh, steam does very interesting things in combust combustion. Um, if you're trying to crack, to the degree to which you can have steam in the system will improve your cracking reactions um, uh, during combustion and cracking. Okay? The steam is like a partial oxidizer. Um, so we use steam cleaning on hydrocarbons. Um, it, it breaks them apart. Uh, it is reactive with them. Okay? Um, and these things will impact our total temps achieved, the tar cracking success or lack thereof, slagging of minerals, um, and the ratio of the char to the tar gas consumed. Uh, one of the main issues we're working on right now in controlling combustion is the slagging issue. Um, as you get outside of uh, wood-based materials, which are typically very low mineral content, um, you start getting into mineral mounts where slagging becomes a very significant issue. Okay? And slag is the melting of those minerals into some sort of glass-type rock. And once it's formed that rock, you can't get it out of the system. You can't burn it out. Okay? So you end up going in there and digging in some fashion. So controlling the temperature or the interaction such that you never go above the, um, the slag creating temperatures is very critical to not drive this thing into an error state that you're now going to have to go dig out. Okay? So we had a big problem with, um, when we were in Liberia and Nigeria recently, we were running um, um, palm nut shells, which we'd never been in a place that we'd actually had palm nut kernels to work with. Okay? And this is, this is the palm nut that you make um, palm oil with, okay? all over the world. Um, and there's, there's, an outside, uh, there's an outside oil oil area that they squish, then there's this incredibly dense hard shell, and then there's another nut, nut on the inside. Okay? And you know, in the more manual areas, they don't even bother to crack that nut at times because it's so hard to get into it to get the one in the center. Okay? But that nut is the perfect shape. It's about that big. Okay? Um, the problem is that nut is the most dense nut I have ever seen in my life. Okay? Uh, it's so dense that it, it basically is, it can't have any water in it. Um, because there's no space in it. It's all stuff, in very little bits. It doesn't expand or contract. It's, it's, it's incredibly hard material. And like most nuts, it's, its fixed carbon to volatile ratio is very high. And as you go progressively towards carbon and away from your volatiles, your combustion temperatures all, also go up. If you look raw oxidation energy of carbon versus hydrogen, carbon's way higher. This is why like in a we're making a forge, we use pure carbon, we blow air into it. Okay? So as, you're fixed, as these ratios go more towards high fixed carbon amounts, your combustion temperatures also go up. So this, this palm nut shell burned hotter than anything we've ever put in these gasifiers. And we're having huge problems, even at idle in these, um, um, keeping the temperatures below the slagging temperatures and below the temperatures just mount, melt down the hearth. Okay? So the, like the first time we ran it, we created a, like a slag pie that was the entire top of the hearth, just solid in there. Okay? And then we started doing things by you can, you can leak air in or put water in to, um, to control the temperature. Instead of bringing in the air right at the hearth, you can start leaking it in the top of the reactor such that the combustion spreads out. You move it kind of progressively towards a stratified downdraft create kind of these hybrid modes. And as you allow more air in the top, you de-densify the combustion down in the hearth such that you achieve less temperatures. So for those projects, we're going to have to build a temperature management system that can variably um, allow this air in, 
as well as um, um, introduce uh, water into the system through the air lines in relation to the temperatures that we're measuring down inside, and then have that on an automated loop. Okay? <laughs> we're also doing a, a Gates Foundation project with human solid waste, which is a, um, an incredibly difficult fuel. because It's very high moisture content, very high fixed carbon, um, and it, it smells horrendous. Um, and so that also, that one, the first time we ran that stuff, it slagged so bad that it made a, a mold in rock of the inside of the, the hearth, okay? Solid, top to bottom. So as once you start getting the, the, the slag going up in the top, you now start to, to challenge the actual material of the gasifier. So if there's a rock here, air's coming out, you have your, your hearth here, the flow is no longer out in the middle where your bed is essentially your insulator. It's now right up against the metal. It passes down between that rock and the, and the wall. So then you start melting out all the bells. Okay. So the slagging, the slagging is a very dangerous runaway condition. Okay. So in, in uh, combustion, we can be controlling these various factors to, to um, deal with that, that, um, that slagging problem. Uh, it's fine. The thing, that's not, it, 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 the thing that's not usually realized, like we, when we were running the palm nut shells, we were doing a lot of those that were very oily. Okay? A lot of your nut shells are very oily. Um, and the, the oils, oddly, um, it burn at lower temperatures than, than the raw shells, because okay? they are you know, hydrocarbon chains. So they have to be fragmented. That fragmentation is a pyrolysis process that's taking energy out of the system. And to the degree to which you have any hydrogen, um, you're going to be burning at a lower temperature than the, the raw carbon. So any of the other volatiles or oils that you put in here always burn at a lower temperature than the pure carbon. And they, uh, and they take energy as you're fragmenting them to get them into a combustible mm -hmm. form. Correct. Um, as, a, as a material, yes. Um, the question in that, the composition of that will work. The, the problem is, if, is your densification adequate such that the, the pellet or the chunk isn't going to decompose um, in the reactor? Because these are all closed top reactors, to the degree to which you get any steam in there, it will tend to decompose that, that pellet or that briquette. That tends to not be a problem while it's running, okay, because it keeps pulling the steam down through. But when you shut it off, if the thing's full of the, the pellet, the steam, further steam's generated in the system because it's sitting there hot, and it goes up and it decomposes the pellet. Hello, 5%. Same thing? 5% uh, moisture? Okay. Well, no, it's just... Yeah, so it becomes an operational dependency. And you know, in time, we'll, we'll have an option where you can add an airlock such that all of your hopper is outside of the reactor environment, and then your pellet, once it goes into the environment, it's, it's, um, it's in action, um, and, but steam can't come back out. Once you pyrolysize the densified fuel, it's much more stable than it is as, a, as, a, as the raw pellet, as you see from torfication. Okay, so is, 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 once you get it through the pyrolysis stage, you're okay. But it's that interim between the drying and the pyrolysis where it's at risk, and particularly when you shut it down, and all the heat in the system is continuing to vaporize water, um, and it can just come apart as mush. Okay, so the current solution is you have to be willing to deal with it in, in operation. You have to be willing to, to run the fuel out um, or shut the auger down before before, um, and so you don't fill the pyrocoil still with um, pyrolysizing material, okay? So the, the densified fuel is important for a lot of people, um, and it's, 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 um, it's sensitive in these machines now. 
Okay, last one very quickly. I'm going on way too long. Variability and reduction. Okay? Reduction, like all the rest of these, isn't one thing. It's a whole range of problems put together. So starting with what are your feedstocks? Well, um, depending on how you made the charcoal and pyrolysis, it's going to be a variable reaction in the, the reduction bed. Um, the size, surface area, is going to impact it. Um, the temperature is going to impact it. And it's not just linearly related. So your two, your two gaseous feedstocks to reduction are, again, water vapor and, and carbon dioxide. Um, their dynamics and reduction we're learning are quite different. Um, the CO2 needs a much higher temperature to do any useful amount of, of reduction than water vapor needs. Uh, water vapor, on the other hand, likes a much longer residence time than CO2. So if you have a very high, high CO2 temperature, you can get very complete conversion at very fast flow rates to these things. Um, the water vapor that's coming out is much more impacted by how fast you're pulling the reactor versus what the temperatures are in there. Okay? So the ideal reactor for re reduction environment for um, uh, complete conversion is very high temperature and as long a, a long a residence time as possible. Okay? Which those are usually created in the opposite situation. The high temperatures from high combustion, which means usually a high flow rate. Um, and as you drop the flow rate and have more residence time, well, now the top temps drop, okay? So um, with the gas analyzer, you can see these things uh, moving around between your com completion of your CO2 reduction versus your, versus your um, um, hydrogen, excuse me, water uh, reduction. Okay, um, and then all of that thermochemical stuff sounds very exciting and we fight it or we want to we want to optimize it and make it very efficient, but at the end of the day, the thing that stops the show is as that material is coming down and reducing chemically, it's also reducing in size. And as it reduces in size, it is gas is coming down through it, and you get into a situation where gas and gravity are going in the same direction, and it likes to pack and make a cake. And bell packing is the biggest risk of, of, of failure while running these things. The keeping of the small fuel moving and purging out of the system is a, is a very significant challenge. Now, the goal here is a train of processes that's always moving, ending up in ash and small charcoal going out the end. But if, as soon as you fail to keep that, the, those small pieces moving out the end, they stop and now will just slowly build up in the bell. Okay? As soon as you pack in any one area and you stop that flow, any reduction that's happening above is pulling the charcoal or the carbon off of the charcoal, and what does it leave? It leaves minerals, and the minerals are going to be small, little powdery things. And so that falls down onto this non-moving base. So that base just keeps building up, building up, building up. It doesn't flow out until it reaches the constriction, the combustion area. So now you're combusting directly against a, a bowl of minerals. Okay? So the... The end state of, of a, a slag runaway usually starts by a, a bell purging failure. Okay? You can be running at reasonable temperatures um, if everything's moving, but once it stops and you start to get this very high mineral content char ash backing up into there, you'll end up with that up in the combustion zone, and now you're, you're combusting right against the minerals, and you get a very high um, uh, slag conversion or creation. Okay? So the keeping of, the, of these bells um, purging and um, doing that over many different fuel types is, is, a, is a huge challenge in these. And tomorrow I'll go through some of the specific things that we're doing on that uh, the, and some of the both techniques operationally as well as ch changes that are happening in the design of these to improve the window over which it'll operate reasonably. Some fuels there's no issue, I mean, like walnut shells never have an issue. Um, Wood chips, depending on how they're made, they can be fine or they can have a problem. Um, and the problem in the end is just the solution, once if it's failed, is when you're taking the ash out, you've got to poke it and break out that, um, the packed area, which is annoying, but it can be fixed. Okay? So a lot of the stuff you don't see when you have them on, on vehicles and you're running it for, you, know, you start the vehicle and you drive a half hour, that's quite a trip, actually. Whereas on this, the point is to start it, walk away from it, and run it for 10 hours. So a lot of things happen in that 20 times longer runtime that you don't see in, 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 in vehicles. 
Okay. Um, and finally, variability reduction. Um, you know, we want to have our ma max uh, density or energy density gas, so we want to finish reduction as far as possible. So trying to get to some shape and residence time that we get the most completion of reduction. And we also want to finish as far as possible because we want the coolest gas coming out such that we have the, the, you know, the least heating problems in that gas downstream. Ultimately, that gas needs to be um, at atmospheric temperature to go into the engine. So every, every point that we start above that, we're having to do something to get rid of that heat. Now, fortunately, we're doing most of that cooling with these, these heat exchange steps. But um, there's a lack of those. Oops. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's see there. By cooling the gas, we also increase the risk of dew point of the tar that we left over. Yeah, if you have tar in it, the dew point's going to be in the 300, 350 C range. Okay. Um, and you'll usually see that. That's where you have a lot of soot that starts to stick there. Okay. Yeah, but at some point you're going to do something with it that, that's going to, well, that's, I, that's why your ideal flare system doesn't cool, doesn't get cool. It stays above that temperature such that as you're starting up and you have messy gas, you never, it doesn't de deposit because it's not below the dew, dew point. Once you're running it into the engine, you've got to get it down to atmospheric temperatures and it's going to condense. So right now, these systems, because we wanted to be able to start them on a battery, um, we had to use blowers. Um, we were trying to use our old ejector systems, but uh, they, they, um, they take too much power to, to, to pull adequate gas. So to get it to start off a battery, we had to go to these very efficient permanent magnet blowers that are, that, are, that are very sensitive and fussy, which means the gas has to be very clean and it has to be very cool. So now you're starting the system with the requirement that you have to take the gas through all of, all of your, your lines through the filter, whatnot, um, to get it to a temperature that you can take into the, into, the, um, um, into the flare, or into the blower and then into the flare. If you're working with an, an, an adductor, which is a, a little tube that you're using a blast of air to generate vacuum, um, there's no moving parts, nothing gets stuck, it's made out of metal, there's no, there's no heat issues. Now you can run a system where you never let the gas that's coming out get below 350C, take it into the, take it into the flare, burn it off, and you don't, have, you don't have schmutz building up in the system. Um, in principle, that's way better. But in practice, you need an air compressor to run it. Okay? And you don't have an air compressor unless you have shore power. Um, and if you try to do an air compressor off a car battery here, it kills the car battery before you get the thing started. Okay? So um, those are some of the trade-offs we, you know, we've had to look at and how, how, we, how we do this. In the future, we're going to a system where we start the engine first on fossil fuel. Um, that it, it'll be a gasoline or a propane start. Thus, you have any amount, you have tons of energy that you can use to use any of these starting methods. And so you also are using the exhaust out of the engine to heat the gasifier. Right now, we're bringing the gasifier up to temperature without the benefit <laughs> of the engine. And the exhaust from the engine is a major contributor, as we just went through here, to getting the gasifier up and running or getting it to its proper run state. So until you get that gas going into there, you're not really getting the, the gas fire up to speed. But, you know, being good Berkeleyans or bad Berkeleyans, you, you have this, once you've gone to all, all the work to fight a gas fire out, you don't want to have any fossil fuel around the thing anywhere. So it, it, seems, uh, it, it seems like you've betrayed the project to, like, use a fossil fuel to start it. Kind of, yeah, it'd be alcohol. So, but it, the problem is that, you know, as usual, that, that ideological purity um, uh, uh, challenges um, practical action in the world and, and ultimate relevance in the end. So, right now, it is a, it'll, it, it is a standalone um, start system. Um, it doesn't require any power to start other than the battery. It's like your car. Um, but the choice to do that has made the, part, the starting more sensitive than it would be if we were to use some of these other methods. And, um, the, I have the survey here. We've been having this survey. Um, um, is a, a, is an, uh, what are people's, what are people's um, if you could have a faster, easier startup scenario um, that didn't have the blowers, had a much more simple gas driving me mechanism, but required some 
gasoline or a little, a little propane or natural gas to start the engine. Um, is that attractive? Yes. That's a, that seem interesting? Yes. Okay, why is that interesting? Easier. Just because it's easier? Our, our, um, reduce costs, different blowers, less complexity. Less okay. Does any... It depends on the scenario you're using the, yeah. the machine in. I mean, if you're using the machine for the zombie apocalypse, absolutely not. If you're using it to you know, power some place that you're actually, you know, in this economy, in this world, then, then it makes a lot of sense. It's mm -hmm. a quicker start. Yeah. If you're trying to get ROI, you know, what gets you the best ROI out in the field? It's not going to move the cost around that much. The, the major other feature that it does is it now creates the potential for the, the thing to be a uh, more multi-fuel unit. And so you can say if you didn't have biomass, you could run it on whatever this, this fuel is. And how interesting is that for people to be able to run it on propane or gasoline or whatnot when you don't have biomass? People interested in that? Yeah, of course. Okay. Using a diesel as your generator, in some senses, you already have that. You've, you've already got diesel as a pilot fuel or biodiesel, so you're still off grid and you're still okay for zombie apocalypse. 